September 20th, 2006. Okay, and of course, your next is the outboard one, H12. Yep, that's I'm good. <laughs> no kidding. <laughs> Space Shuttle Atlantis prepares to come home. Its crew has spent the last 12 days assembling the International Space Station. Then something happens that no one expects. Mission Control asks Commander Brent Jett to describe what he sees. Uh, a structure that's uh, definitely not rigid or uh, it's not a, um, a, you know, solid metal structure. It doesn't look like anything I've ever seen on the uh, outside of the shuttle, uh, that's for sure. Mission Control take remote control of the payload bay camera. That's when things start to really get interesting. Okay, hey, we're seeing three or four objects. No, there are uh, there are three objects. Strangely enough, at that point, you have multiple objects, three, you know, two more that join in and uh, essentially form some sort of triangular formation. For 20 minutes, Atlantis tracks the flashing lights across the sky, beaming images back to mission control. They're going over the video that you guys sent down. The video is looked at right away, and engineers jump on it right away find out what it is. When news of the sightings reaches the media, it causes a sensation. Everyone's buzzing about these three objects that we're seeing. We're awash with stories about unexplained craft, but when you get these from astronauts, you pay a little bit more attention. In the lore of what are termed unidentified flying objects, one of the most iconic shapes in all of that is the triangle, so this fits the bill. Based on the way the objects are moving, NASA assumes this is space debris reflecting the sunlight. You are flying through a vacuum, so things that are out in space will generally tend to hang out together. Having three objects, you always have a triangle. But not everyone agrees with the official explanation. NASA's uh, explanation of space junk to me is just, uh, you know, just ridiculous. They should be able to recognize what space junks are. These guys are astronauts, okay? Um, they're trained for this. But NASA really does suspect they're tracking space junk, and they're worried. Because three years earlier, shuttle debris brought down the shuttle Columbia. Following what occurred on STS-107 uh, when we lost the Columbia, uh, NASA uh, is very uh, interested in tracking virtually every piece of debris. NASA fears the Atlantis is seeing a critical piece of its hardware that's broken off. In Mission Control, we really want to get pictures like this of anything floating nearby any shuttle, especially if it appears to have come off the shuttle. This kind of warning that was missed in 2003 uh, the warnings you want to get every time, and you want to find them out, you want to see them, you want to report them, and you want to react to them. Unsure what these unidentified objects are, NASA doesn't take any chances. They've decided that based on this object that we saw, that we're going to wave off tomorrow. So our next deorbit opportunity is going to be on flight day uh, 13. Atlantis, we copy. NASA delays the landing so they can check that Atlantis has not been compromised. This is Mission Control Houston from during this survey to confirm the integrity of Atlantis's heat shield. In this case, it looks like it's more likely to be an incidental object broken free accidentally from the shuttle. And I believe that's in the end the NASA decision. One day after first sighting the mysterious flashing lights, STS-115 is finally clear to land. 15,400 miles an hour. Altitude 225 feet. When they later examine Atlantis, NASA confirms that it was hit by a micrometeorite. Touchdown. Welcome back. Congratulations on return to assembly. No one knows if this was related to the triangular formation spotted by the crew. 
but NASA's caution brings the shuttle safely home. Atlantis was a terrific ship. It was real critical that she perform well, and she did. Kitt Peak Observatory, Arizona. Astronomer Jim Scotty hears reports of an unusual looking comet streaking through space. He decides to take a look. I set up with my 1.8 meter telescope and take some images. And in fact, it does have sort of a weird look. The object is unlike any comet he's ever seen. It's got a long, narrow tail and a little funny business going on around the head of the comet. It's really hard to tell exactly what's going on, but something is interesting there. The fuzzy image appears to have a probe-like arm reaching out from the main structure. News of the bizarre object hurtling through our solar system prompts NASA to take a closer look, using the most powerful tool in its arsenal, the Hubble Space Telescope. Images from its giant eight-foot mirror are sent directly to NASA scientists. What they see is completely unexpected. When you first see it, you think, well, that can't be normal. That can't be natural. We all step back from the screen, and in every image, it's there. It's in the shape of an X. It's an X in the sky. Little X going on. Very peculiar. The X shape isn't commonly found in astronomy. Why does it look like an X? It doesn't look like something that was made naturally. The object is traveling at 11,000 miles per hour. Is it some kind of construction? Is it some kind of spacecraft? The giant X is more than 1,500 miles across. No machine remotely like it is manufactured on Earth. But it also doesn't resemble any known natural phenomenon. Astronomer J.J. Cavallars puzzles over the evidence concluding that the intersecting structure is a result of a freak event, perhaps a collision between two asteroids. When you do the simulation, we see that impacts that would have resulted in such a structure being formed. But this remains only a theory. There's more that we don't know than we do know. That's just the nature of the universe. We may never know if the glowing X moving through space at 15 times the speed of sound is a sign of extraterrestrial life. December 1998. Six NASA astronauts are about to open a new chapter in space exploration. Their mission, to assemble the International Space Station, the first permanently manned satellite to orbit the Earth. Jerry Ross is the spacewalk mission specialist. When you're starting to lay the cornerstones of something as important as an international space station, you're, you're pumped, and you want to get on with the program. If the other one has a dash one, then you've uh, hit the nail on the head. Seven days into the mission, Ross and fellow astronaut Jim Newman are installing thermal protection on the new space station when someone spots something unexpected. The crew member said, what's that? And I'm starting to look around, trying to understand what's that? What are they talking about? The crew immediately follow NASA's UFO sighting protocol. The first thing we try to do is to take pictures of what we see so that we have photographic evidence. Back on Earth, the photographs create an instant sensation in the UFO community. They see a link to a mysterious object from the 1950s known as the Black Knight. Some people thought it was extraterrestrial in origin. Others that it came from closer to home. The Black Knight goes back to the early years of the space age and even before. People begin to watch the skies looking for satellites, secret ones. These so-called dark satellites were unexplained blips that mysteriously appeared on radar and sometimes ominous black shapes were spotted hovering in the sky. 
At the time, the Russians accused the U.S. of space espionage, while the U.S. suspected the same. The Black Knight is just one of many things that we don't have explanations for. Certainly, uh, people don't understand that uh, just because it's ours doesn't mean we tell everybody about it. Sure, I'll guarantee you. But Jerry Ross doesn't buy the dark satellite theory. He believes there's a simpler explanation. Jim was supposed to put a thermal blanket on the outside of the station to protect it from heat losses. Uh, I was ahead on my task, so Jim offered to give me the thermal blanket and let me detach it. When somebody said, what's that floating away? I looked and I saw this blanket. I looked at the tether where it was supposed to be, and it wasn't there. Jerry, uh, one of the thermal covers got away from you. How did it do that? I don't believe this. In this case, it's a story of, a, of an oops dropping a piece of equipment. It wasn't alien. It was, it was, it was a mistake. It was a really bad feeling. The blanket looks black because its reflective surface is facing away from the Earth, out towards the darkness of space. But not every sighting of the Black Knight can be so easily explained. There were reports in the 50s of strange things in orbit around the Earth. We don't know what they were. They weren't ours as far as we know. We don't think they were Russians either. What does that leave? Who knows? Bill Young is an Arizona-based astronomer who's taken it as his mission to watch out for near-Earth objects that could pose a danger to us. In September 2002, Young spots a bright object in orbit around the Earth, which sets off alarms. This object became very apparent as something unusual, primarily because of its motion. Yeah, it was moving very fast and moving in a velocity that's very much like the velocity of the Earth. The mysterious object is more than 60 feet across and orbiting close to the Earth. Young immediately reports the sighting to the authorities. The first thought is, this is an asteroid. NASA takes the threat of an asteroid impact very seriously. Asteroids are kind of important because they might occasionally beat the heck out of the surface of the planet. Asteroids are traveling at about 30 miles per second. That's an incredible velocity. And when you have an object that has mass, that's a lot of kinetic energy. It's probably what did in the dinosaurs. But asteroid J002E3 isn't behaving like an asteroid at all. Most asteroids trace a regular orbit around the sun within the belt between Mars and Jupiter. But this mysterious object doesn't do that. This thing goes around the Earth, then it shoots off, it goes several times around the sun, it comes back. Concerned, NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory joins other scientists in the investigation. They direct the infrared telescope in Hawaii towards the object for a closer look. This is the most odd thing we've ever seen. And we pulled up the spectrum and it was full of paint. The exotic anomaly has a coating with the same chemical signature as industrial paint. This object was no natural asteroid. It was unlike anything we'd ever seen before. It's paint. This can't be an asteroid. Raising an alarming possibility. When you think about it, we use spy satellites. And here's this object orbiting the Earth. Why wouldn't an alien culture use spy satellites? NASA's Jim Oberg doesn't buy that theory. He supports further investigation of the pain evidence. Detailed analysis of the data reveals the entire surface of this 60-foot object is covered in titanium dioxide, a compound that makes paint white, the color of NASA hardware. But if this is a part of a rocket, it's in a very strange place. 
The question is, how did it get there? NASA connects the dots and comes up with a plausible explanation. Based on the orbit and based on the fact this object is covered in paint, we're able to calculate backward and determine that this object is the third stage of the Saturn V rocket that carried astronauts uh, Conrad, Bean, and Gordon to the moon on Apollo 12. NASA concludes that the old rocket booster jettisoned en route to the moon somehow found its way back into Earth's orbit. They just float away, but you don't worry about it. NASA closes the case. But for some, the theory seems too convenient. July 17, 1962. At the height of the Cold War, both superpowers fight for technological supremacy over air and space. And NASA's engineers man the front lines. These are the early days of high-speed, high-altitude flights. Everything is new. Everything is on the edge. In 1955, NASA's forerunner, the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics, commissions the X-15, a rocket-powered supersonic plane to reach the edge of Earth's atmosphere. The chief test pilot for the X-15 program is Major Robert White. A veteran of three wars, White holds the record for the fastest manned flight ever, over 4,000 miles per hour. Major White and the other X-15 pilots were flying faster and higher than anyone had ever flown before. First, he hitches a ride to 45,000 feet under the wing of a B-52 mothership. The engines burn for 82 seconds, accelerating White to 3,800 miles per hour. Nearly 60 miles above the Earth, he is higher than any person in recorded history. He was flying uh, very high, very fast. Suddenly there's something out there. White radios to ground control that he sees multiple unidentified objects. There are things out there. There absolutely is. One particularly stands out. He saw this strange object outside of his cockpit window. The object seems to shadow his X-15 as he zooms through the upper atmosphere at more than five times the speed of sound. It's a great surprise. Doesn't expect to see anything up there. He's got to figure out how far away they are, how big they are, how they're moving relative to him. Are they dangerous? The object keeps pace with the fastest aircraft humanity has ever produced for several minutes. When White lands, he reports his sighting to engineers as part of his debrief. White's story remains consistent. The objects are small, about the size of his hand, 30 or 40 feet away, tumbling, and moving along in flight with him. All these are very puzzling aspects. It's just very difficult to imagine what it is that could be traveling at the same speed as a Mach 4 rocket plane. Official reports suggest the objects were caught on film by at least one of the onboard cameras. But mysteriously, this footage is no longer available. No footage. I mean, here's a plane that's bristling with all kinds of cameras. If a film exists of what's going on outside that cockpit of an object, you can bet that we'll never see the light of day. Without the crucial footage, White's testimony is the only clear evidence of the mysterious object at the edge of space. This isn't the type of individual who's going to make up something or imagine it. He saw a UFO, and he had no reason to fabricate that story. This is a NASA Air Force mission flown by an Air Force pilot. You don't get more credible than that. One idea is that the unknown objects could be the remains of a satellite or spacecraft. The likelihood of it being man-made space junk or satellites is extremely remote because there weren't many things that had been up that high at that time. 
I don't know what it was, but it certainly, as far as we know, wasn't anything of ours. NASA officially describes the phenomenon as a byproduct of the X-15's experimental propulsion system. Because of the super cool liquid nitrogen in use, you get ice crystals and ice flakes forming on the outside of the aircraft. And as the aircraft maneuvers as it's in its flight, you'll get breaking off of these ice crystals and flakes. If you're up at 300,000 feet, the sunlight is going to reflect off of that very strongly and make it very, very bright. At lower altitudes, traveling at such high speeds, friction with the air would generate intense heat, melting ice crystals as soon as they form. When you think of a rocket plane going thousands of miles an hour, you think of friction. But it was also in a vacuum, and there was precious little air around it. There's very little resistance. There's very little friction on the outside of the spacecraft. So these ice crystals are going to float along with the aircraft. White remained uncertain about what he saw on the flight. Many others are reluctant to accept the official explanation. Unless they fully admit to what some of their pilots, their astronauts, have seen, we're never going to get to the bottom of the story. NASA grapples with mysteries on a truly cosmic scale. But not all of the cosmos' riddles come from distant star systems. On a winter afternoon in 2012, strange sounds from the skies draw people from their homes. The noises you hear are authentic recordings by camera phones and home video. Witnesses record the sound across Australia, Asia, Europe, and the Americas. Analysis of meteorological data rules out any known weather phenomena capable of causing this kind of sound. Scientists desperate for a natural explanation discover that the phenomenon seems to coincide with the aurora borealis. The northern lights usually erupt as a response to intense cosmic radiation bombardment. NASA launches a fleet of five probes called Themis to investigate the aurora. The probes discover that violent solar bombardments can snap the invisible lines of Earth's protective magnetic field. And the severed lines slingshot powerful bursts of cosmic energy toward Earth. Mission scientist Facilis Angelopoulos calls this phenomenon a spacequake. And incredibly, a spacequake produces sound even in the vacuum of space. These spacequakes create waves in the audible frequency, but they are electromagnetic. Space is full of uh, pulsations that if you were to play as sound waves you would hear, it's almost like it is alive. But despite the similarity, a human being would have to leave our planet to hear the noise of a spacequake. Waves from out in space penetrate through the Earth's atmosphere only with their magnetic component. The sound portion of them doesn't make it through. Sound waves refract before they manage to come down to the lower altitudes of the atmosphere. So far, NASA's spacequake investigation is unable to provide any natural explanation for the sonic phenomenon in the world skies. Research is ongoing.